The town of Harlow, where the protagonist lives, was a small town, with a school, and a few grocery stores. The family often went to the neighboring town to celebrate his father's privileges at his favorite restaurant, but after his mother's death, it was very rare. Viewers are told the story of Craig's acquaintance with Mr. Harrigan. As a child, the boy often attended church services. One day, Mr. Harrigan challenged the boy to read a chapter from the Bible, much to the surprise of his co-workers. John Harrigan was the richest man in town, considered a powerful billionaire running a business. Looking out the window, little Craig notices Harrigan outside his driveway. John's eyesight was failing badly, so he wanted someone to read for him. There were other workers, older and with literate speech, but a strange reason made Craig the one to choose. The boy was paid $5 an hour to read the Bible, or other literature. Craig goes to the country home of Mr. Harrigan, who calls the boy to read. The huge house, turned out to be completely uninviting, and very cumbersome. The front door was opened by an unknown woman who explained how to get to the old man. John sat in the middle of the huge living room, already waiting for the boy. This day, had made a big difference in Craig's life. The boy began doing small jobs around the house, for little money, reading books, watering the flowers in the greenhouse, or shoveling snow. Craig missed his mother very much, but his father was much worse. His condition was very sad, and devastated. The boy often wondered if he was to blame for his mother's death. Craig believes he could have influenced the past to keep the woman alive. One day, the boy arrived early, he was interested in a closed closet. Upon approaching the door, he is stopped by Mr. Harrigan, forbidding him to do so. The man says that the closet holds a terrible secret that is made only for him. Craig continues to read literature, after which he receives his coveted paycheck. He and Harrigan, argue about power, and the cruelty of money, for it cannot make a man truly happy. Craig goes to the library, where he tries to find information about John Harrigan's life. On the websites, the man is described as cruel and mercenary, for Harrigan never married, nor did he keep in touch with his relatives. His whole life, seems lonely, and deadened, for money has failed to touch his heart. The next morning, Craig receives a card from Mr. Harrigan, and a lottery ticket. Since then, the guy has received four tickets, addressed to birthdays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, and Valentine's Day. He continued to come to the Harrigan house several times a week. After a while, Craig began to suspect that reading was the only thing that brought Harrigan happiness. Harlow's senior class, every day, drove to a different town for lessons. A guy named Mike Uber agreed, for a small fee, to teach life at the new school. Hazing is forbidden in high school, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Uber explains that you shouldn't be allowed to humiliate an individual, because the high school years will turn out to be awful. He introduces the newcomers to the cafeteria, where rich kids with smartphones often sit. One day, Craig is stopped by a seemingly good-natured guy, but things turn out differently. He makes Craig, shine his shoes, and rub toilet rims. Fortunately, the situation is noticed by the teacher, who stops the humiliation. Craig saves the angry schoolboy from punishment by telling him there is only half a sandwich in the bag. The boy returns home, where his beloved father is waiting for him. He tells him that the day has gone beautifully, so the man doesn't have to worry. Afterwards, Craig asks his father, to buy him a cell phone, to which he refuses. The guy goes on to work for Mr. Harrigan to earn a little money for a smartphone. It turns out that John despises socialist movements in politics, and hates to follow the rules. Craig wonders if, for work purposes, the man has been tried, to which John replies that it has happened all the time, but he has resolutely dealt with the disdain. For Christmas, Craig gives his father a nice vest, and hurries to open his presents. From Mr. Harrigan, the boy receives the now familiar lottery ticket, which turns out to be a winning one. Craig receives as much as $3,000, which they are happy about. In turn, his father gives him a smartphone, which the boy has long dreamed of. Now, he can call Mr. Harrigan to thank him for the winning ticket and wish him a Merry Christmas. After the holidays, the students return to school. Now, Craig could also spend time in the school cafeteria, scrolling through websites, and playing games on his smartphone. The boy comes again to see Mr. Harrigan, who is about to announce something important. It seems to him that Craig has changed a lot since childhood, but still supports the old man with his reading. The guy admits that he really enjoys spending time with Harrigan, and he doesn't want to waste it on other people. Craig loves the smell of books, heartfelt conversations with Mr. Harrigan, and reading aloud, because these events give him heartening encouragement. These words touch Harrigan, and the boy leaves. He and his father arrange to pay for college, with the money he has won. Craig keeps half the money to buy Mr. Harrigan a smartphone. The man refuses to accept such a valuable gift, but Craig changes his mind. The guy shows an icon that takes him into stock market analytics and market tracking. 
He tells how you can read any news right on your phone without taking the time to search for newspapers. Craig teaches, buddy calls, messaging, and creating pictures. After a month of spending time with his phone, Mr. Harrigan notices strange things. He reads news feeds that people pay money for, but smartphone owners get it for free. There are absolutely no ads on websites, which also get money. It turns out that these are completely free sites whose owners do not take cash contributions. Harrigan notices that the sites find it on their own, because they show only the information that is interesting to the user himself, thus getting a person hooked on the information field. If such sites continue to spread, people will believe even false information, be it free. It was at this point that Harrigan predicted the future of the internet, social activity, and users' lives. As time passes, Craig begins to notice that his reading is no longer appreciated by Harrigan. The man just sits in his smartphone, and pays no attention to Craig. John asks the guy to get his checkbook to pay his salary. Craig wonders why he moved to Harlow, since it's a completely unremarkable township. Harrigan explains that he hates hearing people's requests and decided to move to a small village so that no one would interfere with his life. We learn that Craig dreams of moving to Los Angeles to write important movie scripts. These words, resent John, because writing screenplays is not a rewarding business that attracts many enemies. The man makes him promise that after crossing over with them, Craig will certainly deal with all enemies. Harrigan both frightens and delights the boy, for even in his weakened state, there was power in him. He may be a little dangerous, but he is considered a friend, and will not be able to hurt Craig. Judging by the untouched lottery tickets in Harrigan's closet, he had very few friends. One day, when he arrives home, the boy notices Mr. Harrigan dead, his finger unintentionally causing the phone to ring. Craig takes the phone from John's hands and puts it in his jacket pocket. Immediately afterwards, he checks Mr. Harrigan's breathing, but when he's finally convinced that he isn't. The boy calls his father and tells him that John is dead. It was a Tuesday, and there were no servants in the house. The father told Craig that he should go outside and the man would call an ambulance. Craig didn't go outside, because he started reading a book, A Tale of Two Cities. After the ambulance arrived, Craig went home, where his father was waiting for him. Upon entering his room, Craig sat down on his bed and remembered that he had taken John's phone. From his smartphone, he sent a text message to John, saying that he was going to miss the daytime hangouts very much. At John's funeral, Craig gave his speech, after which everyone started walking up to the casket, saying goodbye to his buddy. The guy wanted to be the last one to say goodbye to him, and after waiting for everyone to leave, he went over. The whole room was now empty, and Craig, after watching for a while, put John's phone in his pocket. Mr. Harrigan, was buried next to Craig's mother's grave, which he had only been to once, though his father had been there every week. On his way out of the cemetery, as Craig walked with his father, he was hailed by a man who introduced himself as John's lawyer. Craig thought he was in some kind of trouble, but the lawyer just handed the teenager a letter. He added that John had given him the letter, two months ago, and told him to keep it until he died. Father and son got into the car, where the teenager tried to make up his mind to read the letter. In the letter, Harrigan talks about leaving the boy $800,000, enough for four years of college and career development. John wrote that he doesn't approve of the teenager's dreams of becoming a screenwriter, but supports any decision. John wrote that he, too, would miss their afternoons. Already at home, lying on the couch, Craig decided to call John's phone. First he heard an answering machine, after which, Craig began to record a message, thanking him for the money. The guy says he would gladly trade it for Harrigan to come back to the world of the living. In the morning, Craig's father knocked on Craig's room and called him in for breakfast. Taking the phone in his hands, the boy saw a message from John, and walked quickly into the kitchen to his father. He told him that Harrigan was alive because he had sent him messages at half past three in the morning. The boy adds that John has been buried alive and needs to dig the coffin back up. The father speaks of the strangeness of his son's decisions, for such a thing is impossible. An autopsy was performed after the death, so the man could not have been buried alive. Craig got on his bicycle and rode to the cemetery, where he leaned his ear against the grave and began to listen to what was going on. When they arrived at the house of the woman who had been at Craig's funeral, they went out for tea. The woman said that John was fair, but that he shouldn't have crossed roads. Craig didn't get it, and she began her story. John fired the man, Dusty, from the trailer park for stealing, after which she just left. The woman thought that was the end of the story, but it turned out otherwise. Craig asked what had happened to Dusty, but she said she'd said too much and suggested the guy take something from John's house. Craig took the orchid after thinking about it for a while. Upon arriving at John's house, Craig sat down in Mr.'s chair. The house had decided to sell, so people often came there to look around. After the story about the broken-in phone, things calmed down for Craig, school was good, and the kid loved learning. His favorite teacher, 
was the biology teacher, in whose classes Craig, was quite active. There was a dance at school where the girls asked the guys to dance. Craig ended up going there with a girl named Regina. They danced nicely, but the girl retreated to the restroom. When she disappeared behind the door, Craig was grabbed by Kenny, a guy who sells weed to high school kids. The guys walked out of the building, after which, Craig was accused of being a traitor. The guy tried to deny it, but the excuses didn't appease him. Kenny put his foot on his neck, and threatened reprisals if he told him what had happened. After that, Kenny left in an unknown direction, and Craig was still lying on the ground. Regina found him in that position and took the boy to his biology teacher. The woman treated the teenager's wounds, and asked the girl to call Craig's father. The boy continued to deny that he had been beaten by Kenny. The teacher wiped the blood from the teenager's lip, and at the same time answered the boy's questions. Craig thanked the woman for her help, and showered him with compliments. Already in the car, Craig's father asked again about the bully who had beaten him, but the boy said nothing. At home, the teenager dialed John's number again. He knew the man wouldn't hear him, but he kept talking anyway. Craig was worried that Kenny wouldn't leave him alone and was sad that John wasn't around to give advice. After these words, he hung up. A short time later, Craig received a text message on his phone from Uber saying that Yanko had died. Craig and his friends, drove to the house, and watched as the body was carried away and the parents grieved. Already at school, sitting in biology, Craig was thinking and didn't notice the end of class at all. Miss Hart distracted him from his thoughts. The woman said she had seen Kenny's problematic case, and she encouraged Craig. Almost out of the classroom, she said she couldn't be happy about the child's death, but she was glad Craig was alive. The boy wondered if the teacher believed in ghosts, but didn't hear back, and went to his next class. After the school day, the boy went to the trailer park, but when he got to the door of the right trailer, he heard a woman's voice behind him. She asked to go into the garage where Dusty's car was. As Craig looked at the car, he noticed Harrigan's familiar lottery ticket. The guy noticed a strange inscription on the door, but the woman didn't know the meaning. Craig went home without answering anything to the woman. At home, Craig started calling John again to ask if he had anything to do with Kenny's death, because it seems crazy. Craig asked John to knock on the wall three times if he was involved in the death. After that, the guy hung up, and waited for the knock. The phone rang abruptly, which really scared Craig. He was afraid to look at the incoming call, and didn't even go near the phone. When the ringing stopped, the guy picked up the phone. Moments later, the guy sees the same same message that John had sent him the first time. Craig went to the church to meet with an employee. The man said Craig's father was right, because the phone could have been hacked and just pranked the guy. The churchman tells the story, for one unfortunate incident. One night, Kenny tried to sneak out of his bedroom on the second floor. But, he'd had enough to drink, after which he slipped badly on the roof, and fell. It was a tragic accident, and the guy broke his neck in the fall. Afterwards, the man said Craig should reconsider his strange relationship with his phone. Craig headed to a smartphone store to get rid of his old phone. The guy got his cell phone replaced, then, transferred all of his data to it. He took the old phone with him, because the employee of the store offered to give it to charity. Already with the new phone, the guy dialed the number of the deceased Mr. Harrigan. He was very worried when the dial tone went off, but eventually the call was disconnected. Craig exhaled with relief, and thanked the Lord, for all was well. Back at home, Craig put the new phone on the charger, and picked up the old one and threw it away. The guy washed his face, and decided to leave the old cell phone behind, just hiding it in the closet. After a while, he got a letter, with a college application. At school, he pondered his own, as his friends, only sat on their phones. The time came when Craig had to leave for Boston. The guy got a scholarship to Emerson, where they taught journalism in a cool way. Settling into his room, he met a roommate named Julian Samers. The guy was studying acting, because he wanted to be a movie star. Craig immediately took up his studies, so as not to let his father down, and Mr. Harrigan. As the boy was sitting in his lessons, he suddenly got a phone call from his father. He tragically announced that Miss Hart, had been killed in a head-on collision. The man said that after Craig left, the teacher got engaged, but that same evening, there was an accident. They were on their way to a cabin in the woods to enjoy the fall, but the irreparable happened. Miss Hart's fiancé survived, and the teacher herself died. When Craig returned home, he immediately reached into the closet for the box containing his old phone. He dumped all the stuff out of the closet, and pulled out the box. When the phone turned on, the guy dialed John's number to tell him about his teacher's death, and his fiancé's punishment. Barely hanging up, he asked for the man's death, but regretted it. Back at school, he tried to calm down, but after a while he learned of Dean's death. Craig went to the vacation home where the man had been before his death. A stranger, 
to whom Craig introduced himself as a journalist, was smoking in the yard and asked for more information about the death. He told him he would pay him a hundred bucks for any information, but the man asked for double the amount. The guy got into the man's car, and gave the money. The stranger admitted that Dean had killed himself in his hotel room shower. The guy left a note at the bottom of the glass that said keep sharing all your love. Craig immediately knew it was a line from a song. He sat in his car and choked back tears. After a while, he went to John's house, and opened that closet of secrets of his. There was nothing criminal in there but pictures. Craig looked at each photo, remembering the man's stories. When he returned home, he took his old phone off the charger, and saw John's old messages. They read CCST. Upon arriving at the cemetery, at John's grave, Craig asked about the meaning of the messages. Turns out the messages meant Craig stop, but the guy didn't want to believe it, and upset the man. As he left the grave, Craig said Harrigan could sleep in peace, and went to his mother's grave. He apologized to her, and wept bitterly, and then ran away from the cemetery. He stopped near the cliff and was breathing heavily. The guy threw the old phone into the water, then was going to do it with the new one, but he didn't dare. Finally, Craig asked to be buried with his pockets empty.